In the aftermath of the world's worst nuclear disaster, three men volunteered for what many considered a suicide mission. Their task? Enter the basement beneath the burning Chernobyl reactor, drain the bubble pools, and prevent a nuclear catastrophe that could render much of Europe uninhabitable. Today on Ready, Set, Disaster, we'll be diving into radioactive water with some of the bravest men who ever lived. This is the story of the Chernobyl divers. As always, viewer discretion is advised. Pripyat stands frozen in time. It's a ghost town that whispers tales of the past to those brave enough to visit its haunting landscape. But it wasn't always like this. Pripyat was founded in the 1970s as one of nine Autumngrads, or atomic cities in the Soviet Union. Located just three kilometers from Chernobyl nuclear power plant and 110 kilometers north of Kiev, this model Soviet city was purpose-built to house the plant's workers and their families. As an Autumngrad, Pripyat symbolized the USSR's commitment to nuclear energy and technological progress. Its 50,000 residents enjoyed modern amenities and a high standard of living, with the nearby power plant serving as both the city's fuel source and its pride. The Chernobyl plant, visible from many apartment windows, was never seen as a potential threat, but as the source of prosperity and a beacon of Soviet achievement. Now before we get to the heroic activities of the Chernobyl divers, to better understand their sacrifice, we need to get familiar with how a reactor works and the specific events that caused the worst nuclear disaster of all time. A nuclear reactor like Chernobyl's RBMK-1000 generates electricity by spinning uranium atoms in a controlled chain reaction, producing heat. This heat turns water into steam, which spins turbines connected to generators. Boron control rods are used to manage the reaction rate. On April 25, 1986, a seemingly routine safety test set the stage for disaster. The test was designed to simulate a power outage. They wanted to see if slowing the turbine could provide enough electrical power to operate the circulating pumps until the emergency diesel generators came online. Each Chernobyl reactor has three backup generators that are activated in case of a loss of power. These generators take around 60 to 75 seconds to come up to full speed to power the cooling pumps. To bridge the gap, the slowing turbines are supposed to generate enough electrical power to keep the pumps running. Previous tests in 1982, 84, and 85 had failed. There was a lot of pressure from Moscow to succeed this time. At 1228, they began reducing the power to the reactor, but Kiev cited energy demands and operators had to delay the test while it was underway. This caused a buildup of xenon gas, which is bad because too much xenon can prevent a reactor from restarting. After resuming the test, the power levels unexpectedly dropped to near zero levels, leaving the reactor in a state prone to power surges. To raise power back up, they removed most control rods from the core, violating safety protocols. They also disabled several automated safety systems, including the emergency core cooling system, to prevent them from interrupting the test. The reactor was now in an extremely unstable state. When the turbine was completely shut off, cooling pump speeds decreased causing water in the core to heat up. This led to more steam formation and more power. Fearing the worst, shift supervisor Alexander Akimov and ordered Leonid Toptonov to push the AZ-5 button. This should have inserted all the boron control rods and stopped the reactor in its tracks, but because of a fatal design flaw, graphite tips on the control rods caused the power to surge to 30,000 megawatts thermal. At 1.23.40 a.m., Reactor 4 exploded. The force of the explosion blasted its 1,000-ton concrete lid into the air and killed two workers instantly. Seconds later, another more powerful blast followed, spewing metric tons of radioactive material into the atmosphere near Pripyat. The night sky lit up with an eerie blue glow as the exposed core burned. Within minutes, emergency responders were dispatched to the scene. Firefighters battled the raging blaze all night, and it would take until 6.35 a.m. the next morning to extinguish every fire except for the graphite fire burning inside the reactor core. Vasily Ignatenko, a 25-year-old firefighter, later recalled, The fire was like nothing I'd ever seen. It wasn't red. It was like a light blue color. 
Many brave first responders, including Vaselli, absorbed lethal doses of radiation. 28 of them would die due to acute radiation syndrome within three months of the accident, their bodies literally disintegrating from the inside out. A thick, poisonous fog enveloped the area. Every minute that the graphite fire burned, radioactive material poured into the air. It began to rain down irradiated ash upon Pripyat. As dawn broke, radiation levels in the area were off the charts, some with spots registering 20,000 rotgens per hour, enough to give a lethal dose in just minutes. Children awoke and left for school. They played in the ash thinking it was snow. It would be just 36 hours before authorities began evacuations, telling residents they would return in just a few days. To make matters worse, underneath this chaos, yet another disaster was ticking away. Below the fire in Reactor 4 was a massive body of water primarily used as coolant. If the molten core burning through the concrete floor breached this reservoir, a steam explosion could obliterate the other reactors and ignite the remaining fuel. A nuclear physicist, Vasily Nestorenko, warned, If that happened, we could expect a nuclear explosion between 3 and 5 megatons. This would have meant the destruction of Kiev and rendered Europe uninhabitable for hundreds of thousands of years. Enter the Chernobyl Divers. As officials grappled with the worst-case scenario, here it was the three brave souls of the Chernobyl Suicide Squad stepped forward. Alexei Ananiko, Valery Bezpalov, and Boris Baranov. Alexei, a 33-year-old engineer, had helped design the plant's systems. Valery, in his late 20s, was an exceptional diver, comfortable in challenging underwater environments. Boris, a senior manager in his 60s, volunteered to hold their lights. Their mission was clear but daunting. Swim through highly radioactive water in near zero visibility to find and open a drainage valve and prevent the end of the world. Alexei later said, We understood we had to get it done. If I didn't do it, they could just call on somebody else, but I was the best qualified. They took out a map, poured some vodka, and drew up a plan. They'd have to begin at an access corridor near the control rooms of Units 3 and 4 and move through the Unit 4 control room before descending into the turbine hall. From there, they'd need to navigate through the damaged ventilation building, likely encountering debris and blocked passages along the way. The most critical part of their journey would be entering the flooded basement, a labyrinth of corridors and rooms submerged in irradiated water. Using only their knowledge of the plant's layout and dimly lit flashlights, they'd swim through the basement following a route that led through the machinery halls and filtration systems. Finally, they will reach the valve room deep within the basement, where they'd need to locate and open the crucial drainage valve and make their way back outside the reactor. On May 11, 1986, the Chernobyl divers donned makeshift protective gear, wetsuits, respirators, and dosimeters. It was woefully inadequate against the levels of radiation they would face, but it was all they had to work with. The men entered the access corridor. Debris crunched under their feet as they navigated the wreckage of the control room. In the turbine hall, they climbed over fallen machinery, their respirators hissing with each breath. The ventilation building presented a maze of collapsed ducts and blocked passages. Because the force of the explosion was the strongest here, Ducts had collapsed, and passages were blocked, so they'd have to squeeze through narrow gaps to finally reach the entrance to the basement. The men descended through the narrow staircase and became submerged in the icy, irradiated water. As they waited in darkness, the water rose to their chests. Boris's flashlight cut a weak path through the murky depths, while Alexei's dosimeter crackled furiously. They swam through the labyrinth of submerged corridors, feeling their way along the walls and pipes. Boris's light flickered on and off and on and off. Then, it just didn't come back on again. Valeri described it as swimming through thick black oil. They could barely see their hands in front of their faces. They only had the sense of touch and vague memories to guide them to the valve. Their fingers traced the pipe along the walls and pressed forward in the only direction they could. As if a miracle occurred, Alexei's hand found the valve. He yelled to the team to come help him drain the water. Quite deliberately, they began turning the wheels, steel grating on steel. Water rushed out, and a feeling of temporary relief sent a shockwave of euphoria through our unlikely heroes. Their mission had been accomplished. In time, the reservoir would drain, 
and the crisis would be averted. Ordinary people living their lives would never know how close the doomsday clock had come to striking midnight. For the divers, the ordeal was far from over. They still had to make it back upstairs, and each of them was likely to be very sick very soon. Against all odds, they emerged alive. They were rushed to decontamination, and in the days that followed, all three men were treated for acute radiation sickness. They suffered nausea, dizziness, and fatigue. Their skin reddened and blistered. Their hair fell out in clumps. But remarkably, they survived into old age. And Anenko saw black marks manifest on his legs, which he half-jokingly named Radioactive Tan. Their bravery and selfless actions bought the USSR critical time. Over the next six months, 500,000 workers, known as liquidators, endured around-the-clock shifts to contain the disaster. They built a concrete sarcophagus around the reactor, entombing the exposed uranium core. This sarcophagus, although a marvel, was little more than a temporary shield. As years passed, it began to crumble. This dire necessity birthed the creation of the new safe confinement in 2016, which is a colossal steel arc engineered to seal off the original sarcophagus and the radioactive remnants for at least a century more. Today, some 35 years later, the area around the plant is still highly radioactive and will be for thousands of years. The exclusion zone, covering 1,000 square miles, is largely abandoned, reclaimed by nature. Wild animals roam freely and vegetation grows unchecked. Pripyat's decaying structures, from crumbling housing blocks and classrooms to the Ferris wheel of its never-opened amusement park, have become icons of the disaster. However, some people still live in Pripyat. The babushkas, elderly women who refuse to leave, continue their lives amidst the ruins of Chernobyl. If you found this story as inspiring as we did, please like and subscribe for more tales of incredible human courage on Ready, Set, Disaster. And remember, in the words of Alexei Anonenko, we knew it was very dangerous, but we had no choice. Someone had to do it.